Hello, everyone. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be DLTs, the perfect tool set for the COVID-19 world. I'll turn it over to you, Karthik, to begin our session. Well, thank you very much, Karen. It's been a pleasure uh, to be speaking at your event. You know, it's uh, really sort of remarkable to see all the speakers uh, from yesterday and today. And I think, you know, you guys have done an excellent job uh, curating uh, the conference. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody who is watching. Uh, my name is Karthik Ayer I'm from the P2P Foundation. Uh, if you look at uh, you know, what the P2P Foundation is, you know, a lot of people don't understand the significance. It's uh, the place where Satoshi Nakamoto published the first Bitcoin client. Uh, the Satoshi Nakamoto is creator of Bitcoin. And it's perhaps one of the few places where he has a profile. So, you know, so it's, a, it's part of the history and, uh, and also the founder of the PDP Foundation, Michelle Bowens, is a, is a man of remarkable vision. You know, he wrote a paper called T-Theory, which is called Common Theory, back in uh, 2004, which uh, set the narrative for a lot of things that happened later, like you know, blockchain, DLTs, and all that. So, so I'm, I'm glad to be associated with the PDP Foundation. I'm based in Singapore, San Francisco, and India. I keep moving around between these three places. Uh, I spent a good chunk of my, my time in San Francisco and New York when I'm in the US. And I spent about a decade working for large open source and peer-to-peer -peer companies like Red Hat, SUSE, Sun. I'm also a serial entrepreneur, built one of the first artificial neural networks in Asia, which is called Spousa, which was featured Economist Magazine as a leading innovator. Uh, because of my association with the PDP Foundation since 2008, I've been involved in the blockchain space because Satoshi Nakamoto published a Bitcoin client. In fact, the largest blockchain crypto news site in the world, Coin Telegraph, or so called Coin Market Cap. Coin Market Cap did a story on me. So if you know if you search for Karthik and Coin Market Cap, the story is, is available. So today I'm going to be speaking on uh, the acceleration of DLTs in the cold world. You know, the world is going through uh, unparalleled crises. You know that you know we or our parents or our grandparents have not seen before. In fact, perhaps our own entire bloodline. And and so our existing systems need tweaking, you know, because there's a great deal of pain and suffering in the world. And so I'm going to talk about how DLTs, blockchain and decentralization can act as a very powerful tool to, if not get the world out of the mess that we are in, but at least, you know, soothe the pain, you know, for, for a lot of people around the world. So we need to go back to the basics uh, to understand, you know, what's happening in the world, right? I mean, is, we're talking talking about you know mass unemployment. We're talking about you know governments uh, under massive crises. You know we're looking at uh, uh, massive layoffs around the world. I mean it's like the worst time that you can imagine. So to understand what's going on in the world, we need to look at the world through the eyes of the three pillar. I call this the three pillars of a reality. So what do I mean by that? When humanity started, you know we started in tribes, right? The ancient uh, order was based on, on the order of decentralization. We are small tribes, so we had a lot of autonomy. We had a sense of community. Uh, you know, people knew each other. They knew them by the names. Uh, you know, today, you know, we live in apartments. You don't even know who the neighbor is, right? So, so humanity in its early stages had, you know, very high trust and very high transparency because people knew each other. But the challenge of this decentralization in the, uh, in, which is one of the pillars, right? I mean, the tribes and communities are one of the pillars is that it was very inefficient because you know the intelligence of that particular community can depend on the uh, collective knowledge of a small group of people and there were usually a lot of internal conflicts and you know there was uh, it was very difficult to scale you know the uh, it was very difficult to scale the uh, the uh, the tribe you know so and there's also a big issue with the lack of uh, proper authority so you know people are usually uh, very uh, you know, uh, discussing, debating, arguing with each other. Uh, you know, people are trying to overthrow each other. So there are all these, you know, big challenges uh, in the traditional world. So Francis Fukuyama, you know, wrote this interesting book, which is called On the Origins of Political Order, where he talks about uh, how the modern political order started in China. So the Qin Emperor uh, was the first you know, a warrior emperor who united all the warring tribes in China to create the modern political order. And 
Fukuyama basically argues that this new political order that the Qin Emperor created, China, the name China comes from Qin A, you know, the one that the Qin Emperor created. So this order that the Qin Emperor created by uniting all the warring tribes gave him greater control or vast swaths of land, right? They had massive scale effect. So you could collect taxes and they can have large armies. You could, you know, better distribute resources to the poor. And you can offer protection from all the, you know, uh, tribes that are trying to invade the country. So centralization as a modern political order, right? If you look at modern republics and all that, it came from the idea of the Chin Emperor uniting all these different tribes based on some commonality of language or whatever. But what are the challenges of this centralization order? So the challenges or the limitations of the centralization order can be understood by studying Rome. So Rome, the fall of Rome is a great case study of the limitations of the modern political order. So Rome couldn't deal with the, uh, the scale, right? It grew rapidly and they were constantly being attacked on the borders by you know, warring tribes on the other side. And then you had competition like from Persian empire and from others, you know, major empires that grew in the Middle East and other places. Uh, the ruling class in Rome were not transparent, right? I mean, there's a lot of uh, uh, information asymmetry between the rulers and the masses. So the decision making wasn't as efficient. And then you had a large misuse of power because, uh, you know, the rulers, you know, the Caesar and the, uh, the ruling class, you know, misuse power, abuse power, massively. And then, you know, they were unable to adapt to change because all these uh, competing uh, powers that came about and, uh, and they were not able to adapt to that. And of course, you know, there was a competition in the sense that, uh, you know, before Christianity, uh, the Caesar was God, right? After the Christian faith, Caesar was just a king. So, so centralization reached its limits because of some of these issues. So we talk about governments as a second pillar. Right, so we have communities, which is the first pillar where people come and organize economic activity, and then we have centralization, where you know countries come and organize economic activity, they come and uh, handle over welfare. And in the modern time, what do we see? We see the same things that happen with Rome. We see challenges with scale. You know, governments are not able to distribute resources properly. Uh, a lot of people are unemployed. You know, the unemployment benefits don't be, you know you know uh, reach uh, them. You know, large countries like, you know, if you look at India, China, the United States, you know, have, uh, you know, states, you know, that compete with the federal uh, government, you know, there's internal competition, there's internal conflict. Uh, of course, there's lack of transparency. I mean, the governments are more and more uh, transparent, you know, I mean, especially the United States has a lot of oversight. I mean, it's a very you know, open, transparent government, but we don't see, you know, the, the great role model uh, of the United States in other parts of the world. And, and so, you know, perhaps in India as well. I mean, India is, is a very open, transparent democracy, but you know, we don't really see that you know, between the US, the United States, and a few other countries, uh, European countries, we don't really see transparency in government. And of course, there's a, you know, misuse of power. You know, some of these countries that are totalitarian basically abuse the power because you know, they don't come from a charter of the people, they just power grab. And, and then you have the inability to adapt to changes, right? I mean, so when you become too large and you become you know, less nimble because you have processes, you have laws, you're basically limited uh, by the system that you've created. So, so what is the example here, right? So we look at the 2008 financial crises, uh, you know, our governments were basically printing money, you know, they were bailing out banks, they're bailing out all kinds of institutions that was not meant to bail out. And, and then, you know, it was not only happening in the United States, but it's happening all over the world, right? And, and then what happens now is that 10 years later, we had a very similar crisis. It's as if we've not really understood, you know, what is happening to the world. So, I mean, I'm a capitalist myself. You know, I've been a lifelong capitalist. I believe in the uh, story of capitalism. You know, I'm an Ayn Randist. You know, I'm a huge fan of, uh, you know, all the books of Ayn Rand and, and you know, keep a very close uh, idea of the... Uh, the objectivist society in the United States. And, but capitalism 1.0 was an excellent model to uh, capture value, you know, because uh, it was about profit maximization, it's about shareholder value and all that. And, you know, it was a great value capture mechanism, but uh, it has failed to adapt with the times, you know? So we are in a very different society. We have, you know, uh, moved on to greater automation, greater technology, lesser requirement of human resources, 
uh, you're looking at uh, you know a crisis almost every 10 years you know or 12 years or whatever the cycle is and you know the world is getting more and more uh, you know there are newer authorities coming in and challenging the world order so the world is getting more and more fragile and and so you know in a finite planet you know how do we with finite resources how can you have an infinite growth model so without capitalism we cannot feed the new population that's coming in because capitalism creates a lot of efficiency uh, but you know the first two pillars i mean that we talk about which is uh, governments and you know uh, so, so tribal societies themselves have not been able to uh, to meet the uh, requirements of this growing society and this growing population so can we tweak capitalism to make it more relevant? So the interesting example here is that this is a uh, picture of the British East India Society uh, in the 1600s when they came to India. And this is a picture of uh, Tipu Sultan, who is a uh, Islamic Mughal warrior surrendering to the British East India Company. So the British East India Company became the first private enterprise. So the Queen of England outsourced country running to private enterprises. And this private enterprise as the Ronald Coase, so Ronald Coase was an economist who wrote the theory of the firm. And he says private enterprises exist because they create greater efficiencies. They reduce transaction costs and they can give you great economies of scale. Look at some of the great companies of today, like Apple, like Google, uh, you know, uh, all of these great companies, you know, they achieve, you know, phenomenal efficiencies because uh, they're constantly improving their business processes. They reduce transaction costs, you know, I mean, they can buy something from, from Amazon or from Google for almost nothing instead of having physical stores. And then you can get a massive economies of scale. So these are things that governments are not really good at, you know, creating efficiencies, reducing transaction costs or economies of scale because, you know, the governments and the private institutions, these two diff pillars, they work on a different measure the governments have to take care of the greater well-being of the people. They don't really care about the monetary aspects of it. Whereas private enterprises are created for one primary reason, which is to maximize shareholder value. So now what is the result of this, you know, outsourcing of country running to private enterprises? And these private enterprises evolved over the last 300 years. And what do we see now? So we have, for example, 1.8 billion people operate in a $10 trillion underground economy, right? These guys are not catered to by the governments or by the private enterprises. There are 2 billion people who are unbanked, billions more underserved by the local you know, banks. This is, I'm talking about Asia alone. And then, you know, these countries in Asia where we have statistics and data, they have uh, massive wealth is being created, but there's no trickle down effect, right? Poor are getting poorer and though there's no money flowing down the value chain. And we also see that in the United States, I mean, you know, massive unemployment, you know, we are seeing uh, that in Europe uh, where countries in a time of crisis try and cut on costs and cut, cut on employment uh, to maximize shareholder value and where will all these people go? So prior enterprises create great shareholder value but are poor in wealth redistribution, right? So can we fine tune capitalism to create a new model that can take the best of both worlds, the world of decentralization, the world of centralization and, and combine the two, right? So the, we call them, like we could call them the masculine and the feminine, right? So the feminine could be the garments, which cater to people's needs and the masculine could be this aggressive need to, you know, create value and wealth and all that stuff. So, so here we have the benefits of decentralization with this autonomy, uh, letting people have their own autonomy. There was a sense of community, people know each other. There's a great deal of agility when, you know, change, happens and you're able to adapt faster. And there's a very high trust and transparency in the, the system, right? And then on the centralization, the great efficiencies there are great control, massive scale effects, better distribution of resources, you know, and better protection, right? So can we combine the two using modern technologies like DLT and blockchain to save humanity in this COVID world or the post COVID world? And that's the thesis of the argument today. And to do that, Let's look at some of the three major problems in the COVID world, which is, you know, which is basically challenging civilization and as we know it, or the modern civilization order, right? One of the first main problems is the income inequality, right? I mean, there are people who had like 
little to no savings, so literally on the street right now. There are no jobs, companies are not hiring, governments do not have the money, a lot of governments are bankrupt. So, you know, so this is a huge issue. So it, this, there's a book called The Mystery of Capital by Hernan Rosato, and he goes pretty deep into this because, you know, we've seen that, you know, even before the crises in some parts of the world like Africa and South Asia, this issue existing. So he talks about the issue of debt capital, and this debt capital is even more relevant in, in, a, in a COVID and post-COVID world. And what do I mean by debt capital? So a lot of farmers and you know, poor people have assets, but those assets are not recognized by the formal economy. Now, what do I mean by that? Like, you know, let's take the example of a farmer, a sheep farmer. The sheep farmer has sheep and cows and all that, but you know, there's no way to sort of, you know, let's say formally recognize that, you know, that, that ownership. And, and hence these people are not able to, you know, get uh, the required capital to grow and scale their businesses. The second problem is the IT crisis. As we know, a majority of the world, a good chunk of the world population, there's no formal identity. And you know, even countries like India only recently launched a national identity program. So this is still the case for a majority of the world. When you do not have identity, how do you identify people and give them loans or give them access to capital? And there's a massive information asymmetry, as we know, right? I mean, the world runs on information asymmetry. All finance is based on information asymmetry. But the information asymmetry has become so large that you know there's literally no option for people in the bottom to do anything. And of course, there are biases. You know, there are things about you know upper strata of society, lower strata of society. You know, banks only want to lend to certain types of people, and all of that. So I'm not saying all banks are bad. I mean, I'm I'm a huge fan of banks. I do a lot of work with the banks. I mean, banks are trying their best, but of course, you know, there's inherent biases in certain societies, small societies, where, you know, there's uh, based on prejudices and history and all that, uh, you know, the, the banking system reflects that. But globally, I mean, you know, the banking systems are still very efficient and capable and all that. And uh, so, you know, what do I mean by, you know, all of these things and how do we solve that with, let's say, DLTs? Now, proving identities, we know that blockchain is very efficient for you know, self-sovereign entities, you know, we have de-individualized entities, you know, using different matrices, using different parameters, we can identify human being. So individuals, collectives, and digital agents can protect themselves by control over their personal data because, you know, today, even if you have national identity schemes, they get hacked. So your sensitive medical data, your sensitive personal data, credit data can be compromised. Whereas in blockchain, the ownership of that particular data is between the user because the user has a private key. And so the user can share for a limited period of time the data to very specific resources and then take the data back. So this kind of a solution is very powerful in a post-COVID world. You know, when people are left with nothing and they don't have identities, I mean, we can create these kind of solutions where people have at least some hope. Uh, and these identities become a single source of truth to the owner and because of non-repudiation and you know, trustlessness that uh, you know, DLTs uh, bring about. The solving of debt capital, debt capital is a big problem. You know, I know sort of basically says that there is uh, about uh, eight to ten trillion dollars worth of black economy. The governments are not able to help these people. The private institutions are not able to help the people. So the loan sharks basically come and take over, and they give uh, poor people loans uh, at twenty-four percent interest or forty percent interest, where a lot of these people won't even be able to pay back the interest, let alone uh, the capital. So, so blockchain can verify and standardize property rights and place them in a global digitalized and formal economy. Like I can give you the example of cattle. So cattle can be microchipped and that microchip can identify cattle, you know, because uh, each cattle can have a unique identity, a QR code or whatever. And, uh, and we can microchip that and that, you know, asset can be, uh, you know, can be tokenized and it can be put on the blockchain and so we talk about mirror assets. So mirror assets basically reflect, reflect real world assets. So we call them synthetic assets. So this cattle could potentially be put on the blockchain, can be verified, validated using, you know, IOTs. And uh, farmers can get loans from, you know, let's say decentralized finance institutions, the DeFi institutions, uh, which can do a much better uh, role using oracles on managing risk in, in certain segments of the market. So instead of waiting for large, governments, you know, which do not have the money or private institutions to whom there is no mandate to cater to this uh, crowd, 
you know, we could basically build, you know, blockchain and real world oracles combining the two to perform, you know, these transactions. So you know, there are new forms of digital assets that we can build, you know, like for example, decentralized finance, you can create synthetic assets, you can create derivatives, you can create securitization of some of these assets to provide a very powerful, uh, you know, multiplier effect in the economy. So the seminal work done uh, in Bangladesh by the Grameen Bank and others on microfinance basically shows that even how, you know, even a small amount of capital can have a very large multiplier effect at the bottom of the pyramid, especially in, uh, you know, uh, agriculture, poultry and all that. Uh, but without, you know, access to capital and, you know, uh, letting these guys high and dry, especially in a, in a COVID world, I think would be dangerous, right? Because it created massive unrest. And the third one is information asymmetry. So, you know, with blockchains, it's open transfer and it's all based on smart contracts. Uh, you know, there are, they, it's believed that out of the $74 trillion world economy, uh, six to seven trillion is basically rent seeking intermediaries. Once we remove the intermediaries, we only have smart contracts and smart contracts don't have any biases. So we look at actual data, we look at actual risk and perceived risk. And the loans will be basically given to these uh, farmers or these people who are in need of money, both in the, uh, in the formal and informal economy uh, based on uh, rules. If you become a rule-based kind of a system. So this is one good example of what can be done. And so if you look at our use cases today for identity, we have things like Selfie, you know, you can deploy Selfie or Colendi. For physical asset tokenization, you have Sentinel Chain. They do an excellent work in Myanmar and places like that, you know, tokenizing cattle. And trade finance, you know, I mean, this is a huge problem because, you know, there are farmers in Africa who want to move their goods to Europe and the United States, but the loan sharks there, you know, offer loans at a 24 to 30% interest, whereas the actual risk is only 13 to 14%. So there's a huge uh, gap between actual risk and perceived risk. And this blockchain-based uh, trade finance and lending can be a huge game changer, you know, for uh, people who are doing into trade finance. So the second aspect of it is, you know, uh, peak resources. So we are living like, you know, we are living the, in the last generation, you know, uh, we've been exploiting resources, whether it's peak phosphorus or, you know, rare earth minerals, we've been sort of exploiting the planet, like, you know, we're gonna leave the planet and go somewhere else. So there's a book called Peak Everything by Richard Heinberg, where he talks about in, in great detail on how we've been exploiting the planet and, uh, and the effect of that in climate and economics and everything else. You know, as the, the Club of Rome gathered in the 70s and 80s talking about, uh, you know, what we're doing, you know, the fundamental model of economics where, you know, we exploit, you know, a finite resource-based planet uh, with a infinite, you know, growth model. And we are seeing the result of that 30, 40 years from now. I mean, from, from then, you know, from the 70s to 2020. 50 years, the world has fundamentally changed, right? I mean, we're talking about tsunamis, we're talking about earthquakes. You know, so it's been like a very uh, a transformatory uh, 50 years. And, uh, and that's also the power of exponential. So cities around the world are choking with cars and houses. And a lot of the time, you know, these houses and cars are not used. You know, so people buy these things. And like, if you look at an average person living in a city, most of the time they take public transportation. They don't even use a car. They use a car three or four times a day. I mean, three, three or four times a month. And for that, you know, they buy a resource, right? So you're spending steel, you're spending on rubber, you're spending on these batteries, uh, lithium and all that. So a lot of resources are being used. Uh, there's a lot of wastage of uh, moving physical assets. You know, like let's say you have gold, you're mining it someplace, you're processing it into another place, you're holding it in another place. There's a lot of uh, effort and, you know, uh, there's a lot of resources that are expended to move these physical resources. There's limited capital in eco-friendly growth. I mean, a lot of people don't factor in nature and nature is the only thing of any real value and that's not accounted in our economic model. So what are the solutions for this from a DLT perspective in a post COVID world? So the problem of overcrowding can be solved with tokenization because we do better yield management, you know? So based on, you know, capacity management, you know, we can uh, look at uh, ways in which some of these common resources, like let's say cars or, uh, you know, other resources that we don't use on a regular basis uh, can be brought in through a sharing economy model, tokenized, and then you can give access token for people in that particular network, you know, who are authenticated using self sovereign identities. And then, uh, you know, they can make use of the resources. 
So again, you know, we have uh, people who've got like 10 or 20 houses where they don't live and they just buy the houses as investment, but those houses sitting around, I mean, those houses can be tokenized. And again, with access tokens and with, you know, uh, the trading of those tokens uh, in the market, you know, they can leverage, uh, you know, uh, they can leverage the, the value of those uh, assets. And then you have lack of capital for sustainable development. I mean, people keep talking about sustainable growth and eco-friendly growth and all that, but nobody does it because there's no monetary value associated with it. But now, you know, with carbon capture and putting the carbon capture on the blockchain, we are able to basically affect a fundamental change. Uh, you know, there are various projects uh, today that are looking at some of these uh, solutions. Like for example, for capacity management, there's a company called Bitcar that allows you to uh, do car sharing on the blockchain. It looks at capacity, it looks at yield, and then, uh, you know, you invest this thing. And then you have improved resource utilization, like the ZX, for example, from Israel has a tokenization of diamonds. So instead of moving the physical diamond around and, you know, spending millions of dollars for security and transportation and all that, they basically tokenize the diamond and then you basically trade on the diamond instead of trading the physical diamond. And then you have gold X, which is a gold back token instead of moving physical gold around and spending you know, massive amounts of money and transporting some of these things, you basically tokenize it and then you move these things around. And for sustainable development, there have been projects like Earth Token and Queenium, which incentivize people to do carbon capture, carbon trading, you know, uh, eco-friendly power generation and all those things, right? I mean, everything that uh, uh, is sustainable and, and earth friendly, I mean, they're creating new types of incentives for people to participate in that. And these green certificates are put on the blockchain, so they're verified, validated, and all that. And it provides a handle uh, for people to earn a living in a, in a COVID-driven world. So, and the final problem is the problem of the under or unutilized human capital. I mean, look at the amount of population that is being wasted. So you, you look, you have countries like India, Nigeria, Brazil, and the United States, where a good chunk of the population between 15 to 24 do not meet the criteria of the labor skills that are required in the market today. So, and there are many problems to, you know, there are many dimensions to this problem of underutilized and unutilized human capital. The first one is access to entrepreneurial credit. A lot of these entrepreneurs, it's very difficult to get access to capital because, you know, they don't have any assets uh, to, to show for. And the venture capital in some, a lot of these countries are not evolved enough. So it becomes very hard for them to get access to capital. And second is the inability to verify credentials. Uh, like I say, somebody has a skill set, how do you verify and validate it? So, and it's very hard for a lot of these companies to hire cross what talent. I mean, you know, countries have limitations on, uh, you know, uh, financial movement, you know, human capital movement and other things. So, you know, because of their own local populations, uh, you know, not wanting for the immigrants to come into those countries. So this is a huge problem and that causes a, huge wastage in human capital, especially in the COVID-driven world, as more and more people are unemployed or underemployed. You know, we need to find innovative creative mechanisms to create larger employment. And one of the employment solutions uh, is access to entrepreneurial credit because more entrepreneurs come out, they get access to capital, they create jobs, and that has a much larger multiplier effect. The blockchain, a lot of companies that do blockchain-based talent identification, and they have, uh, there are projects that have a reputation-based economy where they can uh, put the reputation of your talent, your skill sets on the blockchain, verify it, validate it. Uh, so, and then you have, you know, blockchain projects that are focused on cross-border hiring of talents, uh, and and they do that with cryptos, and they do that with uh, blockchain-based uh, hiring. So, some of the examples here are Sacred Capital from Singapore. Uh, they have a reputation-based economy. So, like, let's say you're good at like Python programming or whatever. Uh, all of this reputation that you have can be captured and validated and put in a blockchain and that can be used, uh, you know, by you when you want to get hired or, you know, when you want to, uh, you know, have mobility across borders for employment or, or for work. Uh, skill verification, again, Chrono Bank does something very similar. A global job coin is created for freelancers who want to, you know, work globally across borders. Uh, so these are all good examples, you know, of how blockchain solving some very, very fundamental problems in a COVID and post-COVID world. So what will it 
foundationally do? You know, what is the ethos of DLTs in the post-COVID world? So DLTs can be liberty enhancing, right? It can be participative, it can be very inclusive. It can expand the existing limitations of various countries and economies. It's very open and transparent, highly effective, as we've seen in many of the case studies. And can scale globally. You know, if you build uh, businesses around DLTs, I mean, you can scale them globally, as we've seen with uh, Ethereum and you know all the other protocols. Uh, it's an equality-oriented technology, so it accommodates diverse value systems. You know, it's based on free speech. It's based on you know, all the foundational values that we see in the Western world. Uh, authority shifts from locus to individual, right? Because you no longer need to rely on you know third parties to manage your affairs. You know, you can build your own uh, DAOs or smart contracts. You can have your own assets on the blockchain, and you can hold custody. I mean, what Bitcoin has shown is that uh, for once. Human beings uh, can have a personal relationship with the money because you have a private key and the assets on the blockchain, only you can unlock it. You don't need the intermediaries. So this is a great example of how this is, uh, this is happening. And of course, you know, we are moving away from central, you know, the centralization limited mindset, you know, to an abundance mindset where, you know, everything is tokenized, everything is virtual. So you're not exploiting physical assets. And, uh, and you know, you're, you're thinking about a, infinite model because you know you're printing your own sort of you know value you're creating your own value so and these different dimensions of value like let's say reputational capital social capital cultural capital which have not been recognized by traditional monetary regimes are suddenly unlocked you know, creating abundance in the world finally i mean i wanted to quote uh, abraham joshua heschel rabbi heschel and he says something very beautiful he says technical civilization is a man's conquest of space it is a triumph frequently achieved by sacrificing an essential ingredient of existence, namely time. In technical civilization, we expend time to gain space. To enhance our power in the world of space is our main objective. You know, we want more and more power. You know, we want to conquer new lands. Yet to have more does not mean to be more, right? The power we attain in the world of space terminates abru abruptly at the borderline of time. All the great conquerors. You know, they've all conquered space, but they couldn't conquer time. They all vanished in the river of time. So Dr. You know, Abraham Eschel basically says that time is the heart of existence. To gain control of the world of space is certainly our task. We need to have monetary benefits. We need to have space. But the danger begins when in gaining power in the realm of space, we forfeit all ambitions and aspirations in the realm of time. There is a realm of time where the goal is not to have, but to just be. Not to own, but to give. Not to control, but to share. Not to subdue, but to be in accord. Life goes wrong when the control of space, the acquisition of things of space becomes a sole concern. And this is the foundation of all the problems today because we have lost our narrative and we can regain it by understanding what really matters. And this is my last slide. It's like a Sri Yantra from the ancient Vedic system. And it has a deep uh, linkages to the blockchain economy. So philosophically, the blockchain economy invites a new level of thinking about the possibilities of societal design and the sensibilities of the emerging crypto sapien, the Advaiti, the idea of Advaita Vedanta, that you know there is no you and me, we're all part of the supreme consciousness. And to realize that, you know, especially in a crisis in the world, we need these tools, we need these technologies to break those barriers. So thank you very much for listening to me. So these are my contact details. I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter, you know, and uh, I look forward to hearing from you. Are there any questions? Yeah. Do you have any questions now?